All right, after some rather mathy talks, now we're going to jump into something more practical, namely, well, watching out for timing side channels. So I had already given you a warning when I was talking about the clock group that one has to watch out how one does computations. And I had highlighted timing or side channel as, a, as an issue. So in this lecture, I'm going to look into how these timing attacks, well, what the effects of them is. And let's first take a step back. Nothing about clocks on the slide, nothing about elliptic curves on the slide. Just think about uh, passwords. So in the old days when you, um, well, really old days, so 1970, before any of us was born, um, the server that you would be looking, logging into, well, back then called a mainframe, would compare your password um, letter by letter. And so you could mount a password recovery um, by checking how long it takes to fail. So let's assume you're starting by typing AAA, BBB, CCC, etc. And when you're doing this, you always check how long it takes till the server tells you that it's wrong. Now, in this case, and that was the case on the 10x uh, operating system, it would really look at, is the first character correct? No, reject. First character correct? No, reject. First character correct? Oh, actually, yes. So then let's move on to the second character. Second character, well, we get to that in a moment, but at least it took longer to fail than for the other two. And this longer to fail is good enough for my information. I'm sitting there with my stopwatch, but I get a very precise one um, to realize that the first character was probably a C. So under this hypothesis, let's go on and try CAA, CBB, CCC. Um, all of those kind of take similar time to fail until I get to CRR. And that takes slightly longer. So probably R is the next correct characters. And then, well, you can see how this goes. I'm trying the next character until I get to CRY, and it takes a bit longer to fail. And you can already guess what the password is. Well, okay, you don't know what the length of the password is. It still doesn't let you in with crypto, but you find out the password is cryptology. And what you're doing there is for each of the character, well, at most, you're running through 26 different trials. Now, having a long password, say length 8 password, then you would have expected that the attacker needs 26 to the power of 8 rather than 26 times 8 trials. So this attack, using the side channel information of time, has brought down the time from 26 to the power 8 to 26 times 8. And that's a really powerful attack. And well, that's the type of attack we always want to include. So this is a timing attack in its kind of bare bones form. So this is something to watch out for. Now, where did we encounter this? Well, the warning that I gave was actually after showing how to add on the clock group. So there was the double and add method because we did want to compute a times p somewhat more efficiently than doing p plus p plus p plus p a times. And actually thinking about it, if you would be doing that, the attacker watching how long you take would see exactly how many additions it is. And okay, they're exactly a minus one addition, so they would also read off your super secret scalar. So as a reminder, you are in the double and add method taking your scalar integer a, writing it in bits. Um, you also need the length of the bits, like how many bits are there, because we're going to have a loop length here which, which needs this l. And then for each bit, we double our intermediate point. Well, we had initialized, we initialized that r equals p. So we double this intermediate value. And if the bit is set, then we add p. And this was motivated when I got to it by saying, well, on a scheme, just, well, you expand from the middle out um, till you get to a times p. But now let's put our glasses on where we now have learned how timing attacks work and go like, ah, this is actually a little bit scary. So what information do we leak here? 
Okay, there's first of all, we can see how long this loop runs. And this loop, the length, well, this was the bit length of A, and A is our super secret scalar. So if you have a very small scalar or an extremely large scalar, this might give away information. Furthermore, well, depending on how long this runs, you're seeing um, more or fewer of these additions. So you also have here a branch there's an if that depends on secret data. So if a of i is 1, then you're going out of your way to double it uh, to add, you're computing r times p, and if a of i is 0, you just scoot ahead to the next doubling. So we have two positions here, the loop length and this branching, which depends strongly on a. And here's an actual picture from some paper, TPM fail, um, where they were doing side channel attacks. Now, this is a normal scalar multiplication using double and add, exactly what we've seen here on a real life curve. So, this NIST P256, which is up there in the, in the caption, that is an elliptic curve standardized by NIST, which is the US National Institute of Standards and Technology. And this is the Weierstrass curve modulo a prime, which has 256 bits. And they are looking at just the timing information. So they're doing a whole bunch of scalar multiplications and they're looking at differences for different scalars that are put in. So they pick some A into this computation, they pick some other A and doing computation. And you see that the bulk of those is around here. So this is really most of the scalars take between say 8.65 or close to 8.7 and 8.8. Cycle, um, CPU cycles. Well, I mean, times 10 million, but I mean, in this range, that's normal. And then there are some really outliers here. These are much, much faster. And so the authors of this paper um, assume that these only happen if you have 10 leaving zero bits. So if your scalar, this A, was shorter by 10 bits. And then the next uh, part is that there are eight leading bits, six or four. And even for those, you do see you're somewhat out of the main part. So if you have a particular short scalar, then um, you're faster. And well, this is information that somebody with a side channel uh, observation, so in this case, just timing, could easily obtain. It doesn't always have to be just leaving zero bits. There's another case that can be faster, namely if essentially all of the addition steps are skipped. So if the bit pattern of A has many zeros. So if there are very few ones and the hemming weight of a string is defined as the number of one entries. So if the hemming weight of the capital A, which was this bit string corresponding to it, the scalar A, if that is particularly low, you will also end up on this end here. But if you're all the way out here, it is fairly likely that your scalar started with lots of zeros. If you're somewhat over here, you probably have some zeros at the beginning, and you also have an unusually low hemming weight. And if you're over here at the far end of the right hand side, you will have an unusually high hemming weight. Now, both for efficiency and also maybe in order to kind of hide the side channel uh, information, you can look into other methods for scalar multiplication. And one which is very common is the fixed window method. So, what you're doing here, we have another super secret scalar, so the 14,019. And as before, we start writing this in bits. So, here we have written this in binary and already grouped it into groups of four. Okay, there's a leftover two on the left. Didn't really uh, need all powers. Um, so this part here, the one is called the least significant bit. So that is the coefficient of t two to the zero. And this one over here is the most significant bit. So that is the coefficient of two to the 13. 
Okay, so what we then do is in the windowing method, we group these in pairs. So we're grabbing two bits starting from the least significant bit, so starting here from the right. We're taking two bits and then we're reading this as an integer. So 1, 1, that's 1 times 2 to 1 plus 1 times 2 to 0, that's the integer 3. 0, 0 corresponds to the integer 0. Okay, well, that's a repetition. We have seen already 0, 0. We have already seen 1, 1. And the bit pattern 1, 0 means 1 times 2 to the 1 plus 0 times 2 to the 0. So that corresponds to 2. And this one here, the 0, 1, corresponds to 1. So we're grabbing two bits at once and turning these two bits into an integer. So windowing here means we're taking a window of size 2. So that means we're taking two bits at once. And we're starting at the bottom bits, at the least significant bits. And then we turn these coefficients again into a scalar multiplication. But this time, well, we're seeing coefficients 0, 1, 2, and 3. So we have to pre-compute p, 2p, and 3p. But OK, that's just, well, one doubling, one extra addition. So it's not too expensive. And then we're starting from the top part, so from the left window, putting this in the inner part. And then this one goes here, the 2 goes there, the 3 goes there. Okay, there's a 0, so there's nothing between the parentheses. Another 0, so nothing here, plus 3. So it's again the Horner scheme version, but this time we're processing two bits at once. So instead of doubling, we're seeing a times four. Okay, so well, again, you can sit down and check that this actually gets the right number, but this is just doing Horner scheme, starting from the top part. So this has a highest power of four, next highest power of four, next highest power of four, etc. This doesn't save us any doublings. Here we have, well, multiplications by four, which we would internally compute. Each of those is two doublings. So we still, for each bit, need to do one doubling. But instead of having at most seven additions, well, or exactly seven additions, we have somewhat few. And we sort of got lucky in that these combined nice. So we're seeing. Here we would have had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 additions, and we're only having 4. We got somewhat unlucky here because we could have saved another edition if these two were in one window, but, well, they're not. There is actually a method called sliding window method, which would get those, but we don't cover it here because it is harder to protect against sideshow information, so we typically don't use it in constructive uh, application of the curve cryptography. So if you want to do something where side channels is concerned, we always use fixed windows. Now, when you're doing the general case, so this was with two windows, you normally have with W windows. That means again, we're writing our number in binary and starting from the right hand side, the least significant bit, we grab the next W bits. Well, we read this as a number. Well, it has W bits, so it's a coefficient, it's an integer. In this interval, 2 to the W minus 1 and 0. And then we move on to the next W bits, the next W bits, and so on. Well, okay, if there is some part which doesn't fill up, so like at the top, there is not a, a multiple of W, so if the length wasn't a multiple of W, we just pad with zeros. So here's an example with the same integer, and now we use window width 4, and well, what we had up here had length 14, which is not divisible by 4, so we have to head with two extra zeros here. Now when you do this, you realize that your chance of ever encountering a zero coefficient get lower and lower. And indeed, in this case, we have no zero coefficient. So here we used to have one, well, now we can get together into a three. Here we have now three times four, so that's 12 as a coefficient. These get into six. So as your window widths get larger, you typically do not see zero coefficients. 
but that's not a problem because we were concerned about this branch anyway and so what we'll see as a remedy in the next talk is actually what is called the double end always add method meaning yeah what you expected even if you don't need to do the addition you compute an addition so getting fewer zero coefficients is not an issue because we would have to do them anyway and then what remains an issue with this windowing method is how do you securely pick the right coefficients so that you don't leave information there that is possible but gets really deep into engineering aspects and so if you're interested in that um, that is more something for a project not for the for the lectures but it's something to well if you're imp implementing it be careful watch out for it anyway to finish this example we're now grabbing four bits at a time so now we have to compute 16 times the numbers but we only have three such windows so we have to do 16 or three times the times 16 operation we have the first coefficient that's the leftmost one that is the three then comes the six then the twelve and then the three again we don't do any better on doublings we have saved one addition and in general as your window width get larger you're saving on additions and as a caveat namely it depends on whether you have to pay for the pre-computations on the fly or whether your point p is fixed and you therefore have these pre-computations sitting around while it looks like i'm saving an addition here i wouldn't actually save an addition if i have to pre-compute all the elements in here if i do the same as up here i would compute p 2p 3p 4p 5 6 and until 15p i don't even need most of those i only see three different coefficients here and so when you're doing the fixed window method your window width depends a lot on the integer that you're using so you will encounter with four for cryptographic applications but those are if you have 256 bits and that is a case where it's fairly likely that all of them appear at least once and so it's worthwhile pre-computing them and then benefiting from having fewer additions when you actually get to this part but you have to optimize those so when you get into larger integers choose larger windows when you go into smaller integers choose smaller integers there's smaller windows these things would not count as a well such information because the attacker would know exactly what window words you're using the only thing they don't know is what this a was the secret scalar Okay, so of course this alone doesn't protect you against timing attacks. So here we have from the same paper a picture for an unprotected implementation where no care was taken to hide which of the scalars, which of these pre-computed values is taken. And then, well, actually maybe they're even protecting that. What they don't protect is the loop length. So you could finish much much faster if you have leaving zero bits somewhat faster if you have only eight and well, a little bit faster if you have four and interestingly enough because you now have these windows you're getting actually more significant gaps if you go two slides back to the previous picture um these were kind of fluid yeah it is probably the right interruptions but it's not so clear whereas here there is essentially nothing between those you're not going to have some intermediate case of particularly low hemming rate in this case where you're doing windows because you typically have most windows set anyway okay here is maybe some windows being zero there may be some um, non-windows being zero but that's about it all right so end of the talk